Well, one of my uncles, his name's Jerry, when he was younger, he managed an apartment complex. And he was managing this apartment complex. He was going through, uh, going through school and um, trying to you know, get his master's and young married and all that. And so he was kind of halfway paying attention to the complex. But he got a complaint one day from um, a neighbor. He said, hey, um, I'm hearing some weird noises from my, my neighbor here downstairs. It's just kind of strange and all that. And he's like, weird noises? He goes, yeah, woke me up in the middle of the night. It was strange and all that. He's like, Okay, well, you know, and I went over there and knocked. He didn't answer. Well, if something happens, you know, tell me and, you know, get back to me and all that. Well, within the next day or so, uh, several of the residents of the apartment complex came to him and said, okay, there's weird noises coming from this apartment and an incredibly awful smell. And we are, we've knocked on the door. No one's answered. So-and-so had the phone number. They didn't answer. We're a little nervous. So Michael Jerry calls the police. Um, Officer comes, they go to the door, knock on the door. I don't remember the name of the man that lived there or said the guy's name. No one came. Michael Jerry has a key. The officer says, okay, open the door and then step back. Because they hear something weird. And there is a smell. So he opens the door, or unlocks the door, brother, steps back. Officer pushes in. And my uncle says that what they saw took them a minute to kind of get their head around. In the middle of this apartment was a full-size horse. <laughs> Apparently, the guy that lived there decided he needed a place to keep his horse for a couple of days, and he thought it would be a great idea to just put some feed in the apartment, and it, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. Just, and you can imagine what a horse in an apartment had been like for a couple of days, the smell and the weird noises. So that guy got evicted and fined, and I don't know all that happened to him, but that's just crazy. I mean, a horse and apartment, who thinks those two things go together? Why don't I tell you this story? Because today we're going to talk about two things that people think are like a horse and apartment. We're going to talk about God and money. A lot of people don't like when they come together. They think it stinks. They think it sounds weird. And sometimes it does stink. And sometimes it does sound weird. But what we see from Jesus is that he talked about wealth or mentioned wealth really actually more than he mentioned heaven and hell. And he actually said, we saw last week, some startling things about wealth. One of the most startling things is what he thinks the good life is. That the good life isn't just amounting more possessions. He actually says this in Acts chapter 20, verse 35. He says, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And we saw last week that word blessed is actually a Greek word that is better translated happy. But we said last week, Christians get weird about the word happy. We don't, we don't want to be like, oh, don't get happy, get joyful. You know, and we usually say that with a scour look on our face. And, but this word blessed is this idea, and it's not just this idea of momentary happiness like we're happy the Astros won last night. It's the idea about a deep-seated joy, a, just a joyful center, that this is the good life. And then he has, we saw last week, some staggering warnings about finances that what the deceitfulness of wealth can do to us, that what the love of money can do to our hearts. And so it is wholly appropriate to talk about God and church and money. And we, and sometimes, yeah, the church has messed up and it's felt like a horse in an apartment. But today we're going to see how God really views money because here's really the bottom line. You can't be a fully devoted follower of Jesus and not invite him into the realm of your personal finances. You just can't be. You can't say, say, you're in part of my life here, but not in this part of my life. Every part of your life has to be under his leadership as a follower of Jesus. But here's the good news. No one who applies what Jesus said about money ever regretted it. I've never met a person who has said, I'm going to take Jesus at his word and apply what he says about finances to my, the way I handle the finances he's entrusted me with. I've never heard that person come back and regret it. They never regret it. So we're going to look at a story today where Jesus talks about wealth. And we end this story, we're going to see how God views wealth. If you have a Bible, would you turn me to Luke chapter 16? Luke chapter 16. It's in the Bibles under your chairs on page 875. And uh, we'll also have it on the screen if you want to see it there as well. Now, this is a parable. And at the top of most printed Bibles, it says the parable of the dishonest manager. 
is what it's normally called. I don't necessarily think that's a good name. Uh, probably the, the, it's probably better called the parable of the bad manager, the mismanaged manager or whatever, because we really, you know, don't really see how he's dishonest in here. And you'll see that as we go through the story. Let's bring it up Luke chapter 16, verse 1. He, being Jesus, also said to the disciples, there was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought to him that this man was wasting his possessions. And he called him and said to him, what is this I hear about you? Turn in the account of your management, for you could no longer be manager. And the manager said to himself, what shall I do? since my master is taking the management away from me. I'm not strong enough to dig, and I'm ashamed to beg. So you got the rich guy. He's so rich, he pays someone to manage the wealth. That guy's not doing a good job, so he's getting fired. And that manager realizes, I've been enjoying a really cush life, you know? He's very honest, very self-aware. I'm not strong enough to dig. I've been working indoors for a long time and enjoying that, and I'm too ashamed to beg. So what's he going to do? Verse 4, I've decided what to do. So when I am removed from management, people may receive me into their houses. So summoning his master's debtors one by one, he said to the first, how much do you owe your master? He said, a hundred measures of oil. He said to him, take your bill and sit down quickly and write 50. Then he said to another, how much do you owe? And he said, a hundred measures of wheat. He said to him, take your bill and write 80. Now, what's the guy doing? Is he really just going to him and say, let's fudge the deal and, and all that? Most scholars think, this, and, and sometimes people say that, well, of course, he's being dishonest. It's not the real deal. But, as, but scholars and commentaries I read this week really said that most likely what he's doing, because we're about to see in verse 8, the master commends him, and Jesus is actually going to commend him. Why would they commend him if he's dishonest? Most likely what he's cutting out is his take. That he, as the manager, can say, yo, my boss, 50. And by the way, because I don't like you, I don't like the way you look, you look your funny looking eyes there, I'm going to add 50. Or you, I like, okay, I'm just going to add 30. You know, and he'll be able to add this fee and add this interest that he himself could take. He's removing all that. So now all they owe is just what they originally owed the master. So verse 8, the master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. Now, what does Jesus mean by that? Well, shrewd is the ideas of wise and prudent. That the manager was wise. He gave his master a good name in the community because now his debt is less. The manager has given a good name to the people who owe the money because he took away, I'll, I'll take away my fee. Don't worry about my fee. You just pay back the manager. And so now when he's in trouble and he's homeless and can't afford anything, he can go to them and say, hey, remember how I took off my fee? Can you let me live here? And they're like, oh, of course. You, you, you were very generous to us. You were very kind. Come on in. Jesus is saying, look, the people of the world are wiser with their finances than God's own people sometimes. And so they're very, they're very wise and very prudent. They're taking their little bit of time, their little bit of effort, their little bit of opportunity, and their little bit of money, and they're leveraging that so the future will be taken care of. And so as we see that, we then see from, from here on how God views wealth in three different terms. The first term we're going to see, God views wealth as a tool. He views wealth as a tool. Look at verse 9. And I tell you, make friends for yourself by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails, they may receive you into eternal dwellings. Now, when Jesus calls it their unrighteous wealth, he doesn't mean that wealth's evil or wealth sinful. What he means by unrighteousness is this wealth has no ability to make you have a right relationship with God. Just because you have a lot of wealth or you don't have a lot of wealth, that doesn't put you higher or lower in your standing with God. Wealth is just an unrighteous thing. It's just a thing. It's just a tool. And he says, use this thing, wealth, to make friends for yourself for eternity. Now, he's not saying pay off and buy friends. He's saying leverage the little bit of wealth you have because everybody's got a little bit. And some of you have more than others. Some of you have less than others. We all have different kinds of wealth, different amount of time, different amount of opportunity, different amount of resources. It doesn't make you better than anyone else if your opportunities and wealth are bigger or lower. But use what you have to make it a difference in eternity. So when you see people in heaven, in eternal dwellings, the kingdom of God, they'll say, the way you used your finances, the way you used your wealth impacted me 
And it's part of the reason I'm here. Jesus isn't saying your money gets you to heaven. He's saying use your wealth in such a way as a tool to help more people go to heaven. So when you're there, you meet people that say, wow, I, I've learned that part of the way you used your wealth contributed to me meeting Jesus and coming to heaven and having this eternal destiny. So wealth is a tool. Yes, it's a tool to meet our needs. Yes, it's even a tool to enjoy life. But God's going to meet our needs. And, and enjoying life, man, for a follower of Jesus, walking with him, knowing him intimately and personally and experiencing his presence. It's why the psalmist, David, who was the king of Israel, had more wealth than all of us. He would write things in the Psalms like, your love, O Lord, is better than life. That I love your word more than all the riches and all the wine and gold and honey. Those are all delicacies in the world. So wealth then, while it may provide a momentary happiness for us here, it's really a tool to be used to help introduce people to Jesus. That we can use the little bit of wealth, the little bit of time, the little bit of opportunity, the little bit of talents we have, and leverage it such a way so when we get to heaven, you might meet someone that says, you opened your house for a Bible study, and I met Jesus there. You, um, you know, let my church youth group use your lake house. And while we were there, I heard the gospel and I gave my life to Jesus. You gave to this church, and in this church building, I heard the gospel for the first time, and I met Jesus. You were real generous to me when I was in need, and I saw that Christians weren't who I thought they were, and that opened my heart to the gospel, and that opened my heart to who Jesus is. Wealth is a tool, and God views wealth as a tool that we are to use to move people towards his kingdom. So here's a couple of questions we should be asking about our wealth. How can we use our money and stuff to help people encounter the gospel of Jesus Christ? How can we use our money and stuff to help people encounter the gospel of Jesus Christ? Over the years, I've seen people just do amazingly generous things to help people encounter the gospel. They've given away airline miles so people could go on mission trips. They've given away cars to people in need to show them that Jesus sees them and knows them and cares about them and, and heard their cry. They, as we've said already, they've used their homes for student ministry to have Bible studies in or, or groups to have studies in. They've used all their different resources to bless the body of Christ and then to push out the mission of the gospel. People have like sold things and given the money away for the sake of the gospel. The question to ask, and here's another way to ask it, is how can we use what we have for the sake of the gospel? How can I use this tool that God has entrusted me? Because notice it's about a manager and a rich person. And who is the ultimate rich person? God himself. God owns everything. We saw last week, God gives us everything. Maybe you've made a lot of wealth. God gave you that ability. And so he is the rich person and we are the manager. We are God's money manager, God's wealth manager. So how can we use what he's entrusted us with for the sake of the gospel, to do what Jesus said, to have friends in eternal dwellings? Do we get that it's a tool to bless people and help them meet Jesus? One of the most powerful examples of someone who saw money as a tool, sadly isn't a Christian that I know of, and it's passed away now, but this story is so filled with kingdom goodness, it's worth mentioning. This is a picture of Oskar Schindler. He was a German industrialist who saved more than 1,000 Polish Jewish refugees from the Holocaust during World War II. His life is made famous by a, a movie that came out a couple of decades ago called Schindler's List. And throughout this movie, what Oscar Schindler does is he begins to leverage his wealth, his time, his opportunity, and his position to save Jewish people from being killed by the Nazis. Now, we're about to watch a clip at the end of the movie when Oscar has to leave so he isn't arrested 
and he's going to go surrender to the Americans. And it's hard to hear the first line of the clip. The first line of the clip is, as he's gathered and all these thousand people are there with him. He's there with one of his friends and he comes to realize the first thing out of his mouth we hear, if you can't hear it, is, I could have saved more. Let's watch this clip. I could have got more out. I could have got more. I don't know if I just... I could have got more. Oscar, there are 1,100 people who are alive because of you. Look at them. If I'd made more money... <laughs> I threw away so much money. <laughs> you have no idea. <laughs> if I just... I will be generations because of what you did. I didn't do enough. You did so much. This car. Oh, good, what about this car? Why did I keep the car? Ten people right there. Ten people. Ten more people. This pin. Two people. This is gold. Two more people. You would have given me two for At least one. You would have given me one. One more. One more person. A person is there. For this. I could have gone. One more person. And I didn't. And I, I didn't. <laughs> that's just to save people's lives physically if you call yourself a christian today and i don't know if you do but if you do i want to talk to you do you really think any of us will stand in front of jesus and go man i'm so glad i bought all that stuff when we could have leveraged it more. And that's not to manipulate us or guilt us. That's just the facts. You don't hear stories of people dying going, I wish I'd spent it more on me. You don't find those stories. And he said, if I had only made more money, he said, I threw so much money away, you have no idea. And I don't care how much wealth you have. You can say, well, I don't have a lot. I'm with you. I don't have a lot. But I've thrown so much away on stupid things. And I wish I, I already had my regrets of I could have managed it more and done more for the kingdom. We're not to be known, followers of Jesus, for what we accumulate or, cons or consume, but for our generosity and using everything we have for the sake of Jesus and the good of others meeting him. We have to come to realize that money is not the fuel for your story and my story. It is a tool God uses in his story. And he's entrusted us all with a little bit of wealth and a little bit of time. What will you do with it? What will we do with this? Second way God views wealth is God views wealth as a test, as a test. Look at verse 10. Jesus continues and says, One who is faithful in a, very in a very little is also faithful in much. And one who is dishonest in very little is also dishonest in much. If then, you, if, you, if then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust you the true riches? And if you've not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? Now you read those three verses, and to me... It sounds like a test. It sounds like God's watching us to see if we're trustworthy. 
And he is. He's looking for people who can be trusted with a little thing like money. So he can give what he says in verse 11 is the true riches. Now, generous living, it's not about amounts. It's about the heart. And we all just have our little bit, but God is watching us with our little bit and our little while. What are you going to do with that? I've given you this. It is a little thing. I mean, wealth in our world is not little. Wealth in our world is the thing. But in the kingdom of God that Jesus brings, well, this is a very, very little thing. It's a responsibility not to be blown in all our whims. It's a test of character, values, and stewardship. Well, what are these true riches? He doesn't say. And contrary to what some say, I don't think true riches means he's just going to give you, may make you just filthy, wealthy, rich. Now, God provides for our needs, but he doesn't always necessarily make us filthy rich. And he says it's true riches. Nowhere in scripture do we see that money or wealth is called a true rich. True riches. So most likely this is intimacy with God. This is some type of spiritual authority we walk in. Reward in the eternal kingdom. And it's definitely, I think we can say, an infusion of joy from heaven. Because remember what I said earlier, no one who applies what Jesus said about money ever regretted it. Tom Monahan is the founder of Domino's Pizza. If you ever read an interview or see something, he talks about what drove him to succeed in life was the desire to have more than anyone else. But he came to the realization, I may have more, but I'm miserable. So he decided to take a new approach. He adopted a very simple lifestyle. He sold massive, gave massive amounts of his, sold massive amounts of his shares and gave money away. He put himself a cap on what he would live on and everything else he gave away for the sake of the kingdom. He says that this has filled him with more joy than all the stuff he used to buy with his money. Tom Money is the kind of guy that he had his ladder, climbing the ladder of success, and when he got to the top, it's that, that old cliche of he realized he put the ladder up against the wrong building. And I was recently reading, uh, uh, this one guy said, you never hear about an emotional keeping story. You know, well, we were thinking about helping someone and really stretching ourselves to give to the, to the church above our normal giving, but, but thank God we, we shirked off that feeling. I mean, there was a single mom that we were going to be able to help have a Christmas, and we could have helped him, but hallelujah, we didn't give to her. What a great day. You don't hear those stories. You never hear a story of joyful keeping. Yeah, I don't know about you, but man, I, I think if I don't hold on to it, I won't be safe. I won't be okay. And every time, Every time I've let things go and I've gone to the edge, me and my wife, and we've thought, how are we even here? And we've given, and we're like, we've never given this much before. We've never done this. We're just trusting you, Lord. This is what you're calling us to in this season. The joy, the, the, the sense of God's presence. And Jesus' words were true. It seemed that things just kind of worked out. I mean, we are God's money managers. You got to come to that point where you realize, I don't own anything. Everything I have, I'm managing for God. His car, his house, his retirement fund, his portfolio. I'm managing for him. And then the next question after you realize that is, does the way I handle my wealth show God I can be trusted with his true riches. Because God views wealth as a test. He views wealth as a test. He views wealth as a tool. He views wealth as a test. 
Look at verse 13. No servant can serve two masters, for either you will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Now, some of you may remember that last week you read this in Matthew's gospel, and it's included in the Sermon on the Mount. And people freak out. Well, did he say it here with this parable, or did he say it at the Sermon on the Mount? The answer is yes. Jesus, like any teacher, would have repeatable teachings and would teach different things. And that's what even Jewish rabbis would do. They would go around. They had this kind of set of teachings they did, and they would teach those teachings in various different forms. If you've been here a long time, if you've been here a long time, you've heard me tell the story of the horse in the apartment before, because only a limited number of things have happened to me. And, you know, and, and there's only a limited amount of things, uh, things that I know and I've learned over the years. So Jesus, of course, would have taught this more than once to bring it back up in different settings. Whether it's a sermon, he's preaching to a large crowds and his disciple, or a parable he's saying here. And it's worth stopping and looking at it and reminding ourselves again, he doesn't say the two masters are God and Satan, God and evil, God and money. This means if we believe Jesus is telling the truth, money can be your master. You can be devoted to it and love it. And, and the opposite of that is you're not devoted to God. And you, don't, and you don't love God. I mean, it comes down to it, would you rather have God or money? Which one most freaks you out? I don't have any money or I don't have God. That brings us to the third way God views money. It's a trademark. Now, a trademark is a distinctive mark or feature, particularly characteristic or identified with a person or thing. The way we handle our money shows who we worship. So generosity is this trademark. Oh, we worship God. Proper management of our funds. We worship God the way because we're stewarding our wealth. Or it's a trademark. We worship ourselves, or we worship the things money buys, or, or, or the security and, the, and, the, and all of that. Jesus is saying that the way we handle our money is an indication of our true allegiance. Why would I serve money? And we know, we like what money gives us. Making it helps some of us feel significant. I've talked to countless men, and I assume women, you do this too. I just haven't had those conversations with you ladies. But I've had many men said, making money helped me feel like a man. And here's the thing about making money that makes you feel like a man. It almost works until that's all you have. And then you realize, this didn't work. I still don't know if I'm truly a man. It makes us feel secure. I mean, according to the verse, that passage that we just saw, we can have all the Christian talk and all the opinions about all the issues, but our money betrays us. It shows who has our heart. And so when some people say that church and money are like horse and apartment, yeah, there's some truth to it. There's been greed and stinginess in Christians and church and church leaders. Fully acknowledged, not ignored. But for many, and for some, I'll say some, we say it's like a horse in an apartment because we don't want to talk about it here. We don't want Jesus to come knocking on the door and saying, let's talk about your bank balance. Let's talk about what you own. Let's talk about your wealth. Let's talk about your debt. Let's talk about how, let's talk about this. Will you let me be the Lord here? And we put up walls of defenses. And so if you're a follower of Jesus, just, you know, and some of you don't know me. And you're new to the church. So let me just say this. If you don't trust me, you don't trust Crossbridge, and people at our church hate when I say this. I'm still going to say it. I just want you to honor God with your finances. If you need to give somewhere else, then do that until you feel like you can trust us or you need to go to that church. This isn't about us getting your money. This is about if you're a follower of Jesus, what 
differentiates us from the world. We drive the same vehicles. We live in the same neighborhoods. We wear the same clothes. We're all celebrating the asterisk. There's nothing wrong necessarily with all those things, but what differentiates us? It can't be the way you vote. It can't be just that you come here on a Sunday, because you can come here on a Sunday and live like you don't even believe one word we're talking about today through the week. But one of the things, because there's different ways that it, we're differentiated in our sexual ethic, in the way we care for people, countless different things. But one of the big things is how we handle our wealth. It will show what we love. It will show what we're devoted to. So the question would be, does the way I handle my money show that I serve Jesus? Does the way I handle my money show that I serve Jesus? Because the trademark for followers of Jesus is joyful generosity. If you've been at Crossbridge a long time, you've heard me say this before, that generosity is not something God wants from us. It's what he wants for us. Why? Because he wants us to experience the joy of that and he doesn't want us to worship money because it will not deliver. It will actually choke out his work in our life. He doesn't need our money, but he's chosen to partner with us for us to use our words to tell people about Jesus, for us to use our time and our talents to serve people, and for us to use our wealth. He's chosen to invite us into his story. And joyful generosity has been the trademark of disciples of Jesus since the beginning of the movement in the book of Acts. I love what Tim Keller says about the early church. Look at this quote. The early church was strikingly different from the culture around it in this way. The pagan society was stingy with its money and promiscuous with its body. A pagan gave nobody their money and practically gave everybody their body. And the Christians came along and gave practically nobody their body and gave practically everybody their money. John Tyson calls this being financially promiscuous. Can't keep your wallet in your pants. Just pull in. Just how can I help you? How can I bless you? It's the trademark. Using our money for things that will last. People. And where they will last. Their eternal destiny in knowing Christ. We see a, a, a story like Oscar Schindler's and it moves us because we're like, in the end, it is people. But we got to go further than Mr. Schindler. It's not just helping their physical lives, which is very, very important. But it's talking to them about Jesus and how he changes their life right here, right now and forever. How does God view wealth? As a tool, as a test and a trademark. So what will we do with this view? Now, if you're not normally a part of our church, you can sit back and relax. If you need to make a grocery list, that's fine. (laughs) If you call yourself a part of Crossbridge, give me five more minutes and lean in. What if we became a generous people who imitated our generous God? What if 100% of the people who call Crossbridge their home practice the way of generosity through financial giving? What if we became the kind of disciples of Jesus who live in the reality that everything we have physically and spiritually is from his gracious hands and for his purposes? What if it could be said about us that with the Spirit's help, that at the end of our run, when we stand before King Jesus, that we withstood the delusion of riches that chokes the word, and our hearts were not bound up in the systems of this world, but they were bound up in his kingdom and not in money. What if we determined to increase in generosity and be found trustworthy with such a little thing as money that he could trust us with the true riches? What if 100% of Crossbridge took the next step in generous giving? That means I would want you to ask these questions and pray about it and respond appropriately. If 100% of us took the next step in generous, generous living, it would be the next step of surrender Asking the question, what are we not giving to Jesus, his mission, and why? It's not about what I am giving, but what am I holding on to? Why? And there's a point, friends, where 
Not everyone's called to give everything you have away. God does provide for us. But you got to ask, ask the question, am I holding on this because this is what I need to live? And do I really need this to live? Is God inviting me to, dare I say, change my lifestyle? Maybe that's between you and the Lord. What are you not giving to Jesus? What are you not giving to his mission and why? I dare you to pray and ask that question. I dare you, married couples, to have an honest conversation about that with open hearts, open hands, and just say, Lord, lead us. What about the next step of faith? What steps do we need to take that lead us to trust our comfort zones less and trust God more? I don't know what the steps are. And then just overall, the next step of generosity. What can we be giving that will express our gratitude for what He has done for us? Do we give in a way that places Christ over all things in our life? What if you asked these questions this week? What if you took a picture of this or, you know, we post this on social media and you just, you just prayed through all this? And what if you said, Lord, I want the true riches. I don't even know what that is. But if that's just me having the joy of just a deeper fellowship with you while I live here and now and an eternal reward, show me how to get there. Show me how to get there. Show me how to use this tool. Show me how to pass this test. And show me how to live where money betrays, when the money betrays who owns me, people see, oh, that lady? She follows Jesus. You can tell by the way she handles her wealth. That family, they follow Jesus. You can tell by the way they handle their wealth. That guy, man, yeah, he's up and coming in his industry. That gal, I mean, she is just, you know, just doing amazing in her career. But you can tell by the way they handle and talk about money. They think it's a little thing. And they follow Jesus. I mean, friends, above all, this isn't on the screen. You can keep those up there for a little bit. What if we just determined to be generous because Jesus has been so generous for us? I mean, Jesus is the one friend who emptied himself of all his wealth to make you his friend forever. He left his glory in heaven, his relationship with the Father and the Spirit and came to earth and and didn't just become a human and didn't just become a servant, but he became your substitute on the cross, taking your sin, your shame, the wrath justly that we all deserve for our cosmic treason against God. And he did that. He laid his life down to make his enemies his friends. Not so, he'd have a, not so he'd have a place to stay when he's down on his luck like this guy, but so you could be with him now and forever. Only by going to the cross. He didn't slash your debt. He took your debt and paid it. In light of all that, why not just say, God, what, what's my next step with this? I want to be found faithful with this tool with this test, with this trademark that betrays who I really love, this wealth. What if we did that? What if we became a generous people using this tool, this test, this trademark for everything he calls us to? And you might be called to give more than this person's called to give. And you might be called to give less than this person's called to give. It's not about amounts. It is about your heart. So bring him your heart. And when should I do this? You might ask. Well, you know what they say. The best time to plant a tree, 20 years ago. Second best time, today. Today, what if you just brought your wealth right now? And maybe it'll be a journey. You may have to adjust some things. You'll always be tweaking it. You always need to be looking at it because it's the kind of thing you, you work on it today and you go, okay, I'm honoring God today. And if we don't keep our eyes on it, we just drift. And then we're over here we're like, how did I get here? How did I get prideful? How did I get fearful? How did I get all this stuff? How did I get this 
bill? How'd I get here? We just got caught up in the current of American living. Instead of going, no, no, no. I got to watch out for this tool. I got to watch out for this test. And I want how I handle it to show. I'm love and I'm devoted and serve the Lord Jesus Christ who has been so generous to me in the giving of his life, paying my debt so I could be with him now and forever. Would you pray with me? Just with your head bowed and your eyes closed, what do you need to talk to God about? What has he said to you? What if you even asked right now? Maybe you put your palms in your lap, not for me, but just a posture of receiving and say, Lord, how do you want me to respond to your word today? Just listen for a moment. Is he calling you to repent of something? Is he calling you to humble yourself? Is he calling you to take some action? Is he calling you to change the way you think? Is he calling you to himself? That you realize today that wealth does not satisfy. That feeling like a success, making a lot of money, it almost works, but it can't deliver. And today you need to give your life to Jesus and fully surrender to him. There'll be even a prayer on the screen. You can just make those words into your words and give your life to him right now. Father in heaven, I confess that this story and these truths, these have convicted me. I can, probably like every man and woman in the room, take my eye off the ball. And I've had moments, and my wife had moments where we go, how did we get here? We, we weren't diligent. We took our eye off the ball for a while. And by your grace, and it'll just course correct and come back and you stretch us. But Lord, I know for me and for her, and I, I know for several, maybe even many in this room, we want to be found faithful with this little thing. We want to know you. We want to be devoted to you. We want to love you. And we want nothing to choke that out. So show us, what is our next step in being your money manager? Help the way that the men and women of Crossbridge Church handle our wealth point to the Lord Jesus Christ. We respond now to your word in singing. We respond in generosity. We want to respond by turning our hearts to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Just stand with me. We're going to sing a response song. And during this response song, some uh, people are going to come down the aisle. They're going to pass the offering bags. And so if you fill out a connect card, drop that in there. And um, let us know that you're here so we can help you get connected. Let's, let's worship the Lord.